Welcome back, everyone, to TNO, the last of Europe, which you know by now. I'm your host, Mr. Uh, TNO Lover, Mexico Lover, TNO Lover. Uh, but right now, we got to talk about bittersweet containment, as we've just gotten the workers to support us. We're very close with the DFS, but we've got some issues here. The orange hue of the evening sky met its fate behind the mountains as Dave gave way, day gave way tonight, and San Luis Potosi, through the light of the city, dimmed in more ways than one that day. As the day progressed, the chance of protest became silenced block by block, occasionally replaced by the crackle of gun police gunfire and sirens. By the e evening, not a soul was in the streets, or does its curfew gun into effect. As the party headquarters lacked much needed air conditioning, Madrazo decided to crank open the second story window of the office he and Ordaz had been staying in during Navas' protests. The cool mountain air waved into the room, washing the smells of the city under the governor's face, along with a faint scent of cigarette smoke. The disgusting aroma did nothing to cause anxiety, and he quickly closed it. I can't shake the feeling, Ordaz. Sarah Terry looks up from his lamp lit report he was typing, though he jumped the gun. Just a few more rounds of negotiations, maybe. Madrazo leaned against the wall next to the window, eyes darting around the now dead city. Are you suggesting we made the wrong call, Governor Madrazo? No. Madrazo may have been an idealist, though he, even he knew when tough calls had to be made. I just wish things could have gone smoother with Nava. Ordaz shrugged indifferently at the thought, finishing his report on the typewriter and tearing out the fresh page. With the title of the report to the president giving off a much different tone than the office he resided in. Nava protests successfully quelled. While the workers support us, ensuring that DFS support is still just as vital as before. So, we're still going to work on this. We're, we're very close. But we don't have a lot of political power, which sucks. Um, so, we... Unfortunately, I don't know why this keeps rising, but our tension is extraordinarily high. Like, he gets a lot more support. So, trying to beat him up is difficult. Um, and apparently, uh, DFS is choosing their side. We have two months. <clears throat> If not chosen, Celine's support will very slightly increase. This will increase tension, which is not good. Um, tense by negotiations, if not falling apart. I guess they fell apart, huh? My loyalty would decrease. I don't... We, we, we couldn't do this one either, so... I want less tension. We have to have less tension, no matter what. This helps with political power. Uh, decrease pack strength, which is fine. Anything that will... Um, I don't mind... I don't really care if Madrazo loses the support. If anything, we can increase his support, which would take away support from Salinas. Um, but we have to get rid of this tension. DFS support will very slightly increase, which I do like. It's only 15. Gets more weekly stability. Gives you a slightly more political power. Um, and these ones... Not really important. And that one we don't want either. We can affirm pack commitments. More weekly stability, which helps with slightly more political power. The pack members of the highest support from each faction will gain additional support. We can get more support. That's what we could use. We're going to do that one. And then we'll do this one too. Praetorium. Given the danger posed to the federal district by uh, Salvador Nava and his followers, President Lopez Mateos has ordered you to gather units from other military zones and defend the capital from attack. <clears throat> Said Jose Gomez Huerta, Chief of the Presidential Ch General Staff. General Luis Gu uh, Gutierrez Oropeza will be supporting you as attaché from the Secretariat of the Interior. General Marcelino Garcia Barragan nodded and began to recite with a thin smile the units he planned to pull forward and where they would be positioned to address the synarchist threat. At the table's corner, an otherwise stone-like figure watched proceedings with fire in his eyes. Secretary of National Defense, Augustine Olachea, had bowed in his throat as he stared down the man now entrusted with national defense. Barragan, who had betrayed his Belesta, uh, fellows in the revolution after Celaya broke their back. Barragan, a failed governor of Yelisco, deposed for insufficient loyalty to the party. Baragan, who nearly launched a coup after leading the leftist and the Requista movement against the PRI, a little more than a decade ago. Baragan, a general who only readmitted to the army in 1960, who now turned to Olachea with a respectful and your thoughts, Secretary? Has the revolution truly fallen so far? The Emergency Relief Package Under the orders of President Lopez Mateos, his government was to craft an economic package, with a stated goal of aiding less fortunate members of the Mexican society in the midst of the Kabuki effect. Tasked with creating said package, um, Madrazo and Ordaz were once again working into the early hours of the morning, hashing out the details of the new policy initiative. Given the gulf between the two men's political demeanors, the process was arduous to say the least. I know what you're going to say, Gustavo, Madrazo began. We must be practical with this. We cannot afford to go too far. Well, to hell with that. There's a real opportunity, Gustavo, with a chance not to only stave out the current crisis, but to better prepare the poor and jobless for the hardships of the future. What we should build should last. A fund that can become the backbone of the Mexican social safety net for, yet for years to come. I do not think I have to remind you that you are not President Carlos, or Dodge retorted. His Excellency has tasked us with providing aid to the current crisis, not reshaping the economy. The simple solution here is to send out stimulus checks to those most damaged by the crisis. It will buy us some time to remedy this mess, 
and help them not become a burden on the families, on their families, and Mexican society as a whole. In the end, the president wanted the package to finish as soon as possible to address a crisis. So the two men once again had to come to a hard decision. Take bold action, create a long-term fund. This is merely buying us time, send out the stimulus checks. Stimmies, huh? Get a lot more stimulus here. Takes a little more money, but that's alright. Uh, I like that we got more political power. Will this lock us out of whatever we want here? Because I guess pretty much at this point we're going with Ordaz. You need it through crisis, welfare through troubles. Because I would like to do this one. We'll probably go with intertwined interests. Well, since we're here, I like the political power. Uh, I don't want to necessarily do this one, because how much support does he have now? Barely more. Pack strength will decrease. Tension will increase, so definitely no. Pack strength will decrease. More odd support is not bad. But mixed messaging? Tension would. We got a lower tension, so. Very high. 8, 1, 0. No more Salinas. The Kabuki effect. No more Salinas. So I guess we're probably going to go to Ordaz in this campaign. I apologize for those who don't want Ordaz, but still. Um, I like the political power. And I like the stimulation. But it, that's not going to last. You have 3%, and it's 5%. We could really use more political power. And we'll take this action later on. Because we'll do this campaign again sometime. Let's go with that one for now. And we're going to just maximize this. Uh, I might have read this last time, but... It's a fa sad fact that empathy in times of crisis is not always guaranteed. As Kabuki effect ripples across the economy, we must take steps to ensure that all of Mexico comes together to resolve the situation. Everyone must be connected and in cooperation across the country, and they must know a basic fact about this crisis. If we fail, everyone fails. And if they fail, we fail. Basically. You know, just in case, we can do this too and see what happens. Because we still have this to do. Um, operational strength tensions will continue to decrease. Tensions are stable. But that doesn't say, what, like, tensions. Like, what, what about tensions? Preparation will decrease. That's not good. Things are slowly, yes. Tensions will continue to decrease. You get five political power. Tensions will substantial. Ooh, actually, that's really good to do. We're gonna remove to get political power back. Ooh, that's fine to do too. So we're thinking long term here, hopefully. Salvage so position live from the Hippodrome of the Americas. Oh, that looks good. Turn it up a little. Wow, we are 0.4 above Salinas. Roberto uh, Baltazar asked his son as the transmission began. While he watched his son fiddle with the television, he had managed to buy on a salary working for the Secretaria de Cursos Hidraulicos. Balthazar settled back into the couch with a nice cold beer in hand. The television screen zoomed in on the horses all lined up on the track. The black and white ships a little hard to make out this far away. He'd rather have to squint to make out who was just who was who than have to suffer through the unbearable July heat in the Hippodrome. The voices from the television finally crackled to life as Roberto turned the knob and Balthazar's ears strained to listen. That's right. And for the viewers of the track, this might as well just be another average race at the Hippodromo de las Americas. The viewers at home are the ones getting a special treat. Our nation's first live transmission. What a historic day. I know I'm proud to be Mexican today. And the attention of the commentators shifted immediately to the horses themselves, describing a few of their histories as the equestrians prepared to race. Roberto had already sat back down next to Balthazar, yawning as he too leaned back into the couch. He may be yawning now, but Balthazar knew as soon as those horses were off, he'd be watching. Roberto hated the atmosphere of the track and struck contrast to his father. Perhaps with this new contraption, he and his son might be able to spend more time with one another. Well, before we start, uh, we would like to thank the people of Guangdong, who helped you bring this marvelous piece of innovation. With their assistance, I hear we cut the time to set up the connection in half. Now, that's something. I wonder what other technology will be on the market from the sphere in the coming years. I know uh, that I'll be the first in line when it appears. And look at that timing. It looks like they're off ahead of the pack. Is the wave of the future reaches as short as Mexico. Thank you, Japan. Less tension. Where are we are for pack strength. 10. Stepping into the light, 
Uh, General Lazaro Cardenio stood backstage at the makeshift uh, uh, auditorium the movement for national liberation had set up in the outskirts of Mexico City, closer to the rural Mexicans they were helping to reach. And the audience were farmers, ranch hands, and many other Mexicans who made their living or livings working the land of the country. Today was an important day. Cardenas told himself, although the beginnings of this movement would still be small, its ramifications would be massive. At a brief moment to prepare himself, he stepped out onto the stage. The PRI and the CNC have long ignored you, the ex-president began. They've abused the powers, positions of power to lay about and not deliver on the promises of the Mexican Revolution. Years ago, I created the CNC to give people like you a voice in the government and a voice in the future of Mexico. Yet the dream of what the CNC could be has weathered and died under the pure eyes watch. That's why I stand in front of you today to announce the creation of the independent peasant Cut Central, an organization that will continue to fight for your future in the face of the PRI apathy and corruption. The crowd of farmers and ranch hands were ecstatic. Many of them felt the neglect of the PRI and the CNC for the past few years. It also was not lost upon the, mm, the gravity of this moment. A former president was creating something meant to be to compete with the PRI's near monopoly on power. Maybe, just maybe, this was the start of something big. And so it begins. No, that's not good. Oh, happy uh, February. Happy August, everybody. Happy new month. So where are we at? Five, good. Tension's 95. Jesus Christ. Crack down. Prevents them from making moves. Pack strength will decrease. Tension will decrease. You get more support. I think we have to do this. Oh, and we're back. It is literally neck and neck now. Wow. Oh my goodness. Oh, look at all the political power we got. Oh, thank God we did this event earlier. Oh my goodness. Need some stimulation, that's not bad. Yeah. Question experience. Is it four? It's not terrible. Risk revolutionary rhetoric. the interests and all or nothing. After enduring considerable struggle and the inevitable give and take of political negotiation, our plans have finally come to fruition. It was an arduous journey. Certain factions within the party proved resistant, questioning the necessity of our proposed actions at every step. Sacrifices were indeed made to fuel the recovery, but as we move forward, the obfuscating mist of the kabuki effect begins to lift, revealing the fruits of our labor. The decisions made and actions undertaken in recent months promise to leave a long-lasting mark of Mexico's future. The economic landscape of our nation stands to be transformed, impacted by the measures we've implemented. Furthermore, these developments have also shifted the internal dynamics of our party, redistributing the balance of power. As we step into this new era, we do so knowing that our actions today will shape the Mexico tomorrow. We brace for the worst as the players make their final moves. Oh god. They make all the wrong moves, I guess, huh? Squashing competition. Oh, that's not good. In the wake of Lazaro Cardenas' announcement of the Independent Peasant Central, an organization meant to compete with the CNC's monopoly over the peasant class, President Adolfo Lopez Mateos had ordered an emergency meeting of the cabinet. This was because Cardenas' CCI was the first major threat to PRI dominance in some time. His announcement of the CCI's creation seemed to really resonate with Mexico's peasant class, which scared the party. You cannot allow us to lose a grip on peasantry, Lopez Mateos said to the head of the CNC. Look into any way to directly combat them in their message. Let me know if you need to use the military. Then the president directed his attention towards the head of the DFS. I need your help as well. Look into any way we can undermine the Cardenas and the MLM. With any luck, they'll fall apart on their own, but anything we can do to hasten their demise will be appreciated. After the meeting was over, the various men of the president ordered to destroy the MLM and the CCI went to work. Organizations uh, were broken up, dirt was gathered, and any possible means of quelling this dissent was taken. Yep, the peasants of Mexico did not abandon the MLM and the CCI. And said so they continue to sign up as members and show support. And soon they expect to challenge the PRI properly. Oh dear. Affirm packs. Get more stability. Or this one. Decrease pack strength. I don't necessarily want it lower stuff, but I'm gonna do this one too. 51. Oh, that's looking good. Unity through crisis. Secretary Ardaz. 
Uh, welcome, please sit. I hope you're well. Mateo had ushered the Secretary of the Interior into the office, giving him a light smile to try and break the ice. As Mateo sat down in his chair, Ordaz sat down opposite of him and straightened his suit and began. As you know, Your Excellency, Ordaz began, it's an honor always to serve at your pleasure. Quick to turn uh, to business as always, Ordaz had a skill in keeping uh, others as far away as he could muster, which was quite far. Your call mentioned discussing options for solving some of the worst effects of the Kabuki, is this correct? Uh, that is the general idea, Secretary. I'm open to your opinions, as always, if you're open to sharing them, Mateos answered. As is your prerogative, Your Excellency, my opinion is that we should focus on keeping our party together at any costs, as it is a primary arm of caring for the interests of all of Mexico's people. We must get the people and the par pe party at large to understand that if we fail in solving the crisis, then we all fail together. If any part of our structure begins to collapse, everything will come tumbling down. That's all well and good, but we must make some concrete decisions to improve our situation. We cannot just wait it out. And I'm not suggesting words, Your Excellency, or does currently ask answer. What I'm struggling is order, or suggesting is order. Our people demand stability, and that's what I'm pushing for. Stability in politics as a rock of the troubles of the economy. <clears throat> Mateos considered his words. There was strife beginning to rumble through the population as Kabuki continued to ravage the economy. Perhaps the Secretary was right. You might full support, pull, the, pull this party together, and show the Mexican people our strength. You need a, still need concrete answers for our left-leaning politicians like Governor Madrazo. Well, slightly increase. Slightly increase. Impressive victory, the Dominican part, uh, city of Puerto Plata was electric with celebratory zeal from the common man of the highest politicians. Uh, on the, one of the many beautiful beaches that dot the city's coast, Lopez Mateo stands with General Pupo Roman and Fidel Castro as they watch the ships of legionaries returning to Cuba to part from the harbor. Like one of the American cowboy movies, the victorious legion rides into the sunset. Deep reds and yellows splashed across the blue ocean like fireworks cascading from the sky. All along the coast, Dominicans cheer in joy celebration. They drink in the streets, some ascend on to the former Chujilista Gila that overlooks the sea, the Fortezella San Felipe, and you take to the beach itself. Mateos looks at the sand, seeing people jealousy. Deep down, he wishes he could rip off a suit and join them, to splash and play in a way befitting the joy of the day instead. He let their display fill his heart. He never thought he'd stand in the Dominican Republic, let alone one freed from Trujillo's tyranny. Mateos turns to Roman with a tear in his eye. Thank you, General, for inviting me to join you for this historic moment. I'll hold on to this memory dearly. You're too kind. You deserve to be here, Roman gripped the Mexican president's arm in a handshake. Thank you. The Republic would not be liberated. I would not walk away from this beach without Mexico's aid. Mateos pulled Roman's handshake into a hug. They embraced as warmly as two male politicians could. In the distance, news cameras flashed to capture the friendship of nations and the freedom to be happy. Now, Your Excellency, Roman continued, I believe an exquisite dinner has been prepared for us. That sounds nice. Mateos looked back out of the kaleidoscopic horizon. Well, give me ten minutes. I wish to watch the sunset. Soon a new day will dawn for the Dominican Republic. Look at that. Moca Dinista so Popularity, which is, is it the big one? No. Well, maybe. Oh, yeah. This one. Interesting. Slightly less uh, stress. Uh, intelligence, yes. Cynicism will decrease. Power and loyalty will increase. Nice. So they made it through, huh? Jose Rene Pupo Roman Fernandez. Nice. Living ghost, huh? The Spaniel in conflict. Minorizing the military. Yeah, that's great. Where are we at with this? Uh, Mexican Miracle. The Quisequea Agreement. Oh, look at this. Yay! Long live the Liberators. Actually, are they in a faction? No. Oh, I didn't realize uh, Haiti was in the OFN. Huh. Go figure. The more you learn, the more you know. Tension will decrease, huh? Just in Oh, we're beating the snot out of them. Does it change every day? No. 58. We're going to do it again just in case. I really don't want to lose any more stability, though. Oh, we just want to set for more stability. Oh, that was a big, giant jump we lost. 55, 54. 54.5. Oh, happy September now. 54.5. We've got 12 days left. Surprise visitor. Arturo had only been in the state capital a handful of times in his life, and yet by now he wondered if he was more well-versed in the layout of Chihuahua City Center than most of the locals. A map stood before him, marking out the places where the state government had given the UGOCM to march, the places which it would march and sit in any way, and multiple routes towards the train station that would take its delegation back to the cluster town of Madeira. Road and place names swarmed his brain, threatening to spill out, and helped that after the planning stage had ended, the groups of riot had been going downhill rapidly. Uh, the civil union delegates had devolved into off-key singing of Spanish Civil War songs and a slurred argument over whether Chihuahua did or did not have the worst soccer players in the country when Jacobo Gamiz walked in, holding a letter. 
Did you hear the news? He asked, having to repeat himself a couple of times over the drunken revelry. No, what news? The president's coming to Chihuahua, and he's agreed to meet with us. We might actually get some sort of agreement. Arturo snorted. Yokobo, even I'm not that drunk. No, 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 look, he, he passed over the letter, and sure enough, it had a date, a time, sig time, signature, and presidential seal, everything. Traveling Mateos was traveling here, it seems. Maybe something could be worked out. Then again, Arturo remembered what had happened to the men on the railroads. I'll believe it when I see it. Hey, that, hey, whoa, 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 so with this... This is looking better. Over here? Oh, that's really bad. Kind of looking okay-ish. So now what? Also, do we have any of this left? No. No current involvements. The Mortis of a New Revolution. A hot wind uh, blew gently in Durango. Yet the stereotypical tumbleweeds here were as absent as the powers of the institutional revolution in these lands. How suitable a place this is, the synarchists murmured as they shook hands or sand from their feet, rubbing their soles with worn out brushes to only moderate success. Inside, under the gaze of a crucifix imported from what their editor and leader called the home of Semena Santa and good governance sat the staff of the newly consecrated editorial Joaquin Martiz. I stated through the house may have been, the way to the most Catholic cities of the north of Mexico was clear and easy, the better to spread the exalted word of synarchism with all. Uh, a Bible slammed on the table, Vulgate, of course, as the editorial staff scribbled and typed away, the sound of right hands touching the Vulgate and intoning oaths sworn and a murmur repeated. This is a humble founding of the Nationalist Party of Mexico, a vehicle for the construction of a new legacy on the ashes of the old UNS and to avoid the fate of the latter suffered. Knock knock. Sounds aggressive. Perhaps the hour of doom was sooner than usual. Perhaps the power of Mateos' men greater than anticipated, or well, it might have been. The editor stepped out and handed a fat envelope to the man in front of him. Putting his truncheon back in his knapsack, the officer nodded approvingly. Carry on then, Mr. PNM. You only get 1% more stability, but whatever. We see you. We hear you. Oh, that was a complete boss, out of Thoreau, as he made his way out of the Chihuahua government palace. The president was there all right, and he listened to the Union delegates. Oh boy, did he listen. And his finally tailored suit, he looked at them over in their overalls and listened. Well, he kept touching the head strangely and seemed exhausted, uh, pretending perhaps, but he listened. He even promised to look through early into the matter. And then the meeting was over. But it's time the capital was not. Uh, the main group was just opposite the government palace and would continue to voice their demands for a few more hours. Other groups were camped inside the state offices of Bandur Laur, uh, all across from City Hall, and in the regional headquarters of various agronomic concerns. He doubted they would be multiplied by His Excellency's proclamation in the insolent masses. The dispense to, to, to disperse now would be what the government wanted. The pressure needed to be maintained. Just as he emerged from the palace into the searing heat of the Chihuahua sun, he felt a tap on his shoulder. He turned around to find himself face to face with a trio of police officers, one already brandishing handcuffs, and another saying something about unlawful assembly. You can help but laugh. How magnanimous. <sighs> the case of the missing DFS. The cell phone line is choppy. Can one of you slackers get on it? This place is a mess. The PR headquarters from where our dad set up shop in the San Luis Potosi for the Nava mess will have some things to be desired. Though those problems communicating with the DFS seems too darn convenient at a crucial time like this. Odaz raised his voice into the closest assistant, drowning out the small conference room. Ringing up the station at Guanajuato, since the DFS here doesn't seem to be picking up. While the line is ringing, Ordaz ponders why this was all happening. It's too perfect. He finally gets a chance to move past the illusion crisis to squash an enemy of the revolution and now his contacts fall through now of all times. Ordaz turns to Madrazo, leaning idly against the wall behind him. You see this, Madrazo? This reeks of BS and bribery. Madrazo pauses for a moment, then nods his head in agreement. I can bet you 100 pesos I know who is behind it. They don't even need to say his name. It has to be Salinas. Ordaz responds that rap. Ordaz pictures anxiously. Gets us into this whole kabuki mess, and instead of cleaning up after himself, he decides to screw it up even more on purpose. This time he goes to the phone himself and rings up his most trustworthy contact in the DFS headquarters back in the federal district. Now I'm having a terrible morning. I need you to look through some records for me, specifically the San Luis Potosi DFS station. Fortunately for Salinas. Ordaz is well seasoned in these kinds of dealings and knows exactly where to look. Look out for any place balance sheet uh, or telephone calls originating from Mexico City and report them back to me as soon as you find anything. Or Dawes will not be embarrassed again. Glory's aftershock. Lopez Mateos' lips met with a glass, indulging in the liquid fervor of victory. Mexican wine. But he was unable to swallow. Every second the stagnant puddle of wine remained in his mouth and introduced to it a rising sense of guilt. It became impossible to swallow from what Lopez Mateos' throat had become swollen with mere thoughts. As I was, he shook his head and slowly spit the wine out of a nearby sink. As eyes were drawn to the pot of wine, a red splattered like blood. My presidency, Lopez Mateos thought, was made of a massacred blood spat out. You could see the reflections in the wine, hundreds of innocents slain or wounded in the pursuit of peace and prosperity. He could see the vague bodies of all the workers who had been crushed alongside the railway strikes. Um, another reflected faces was that of Ruben Yaramillo, a revolutionary that Lopez Mateos sent his slugs after to execute. 
Lopez Mateos was just like him, a revolutionary brigand, together with his late comrade, Germán del Campo, the president back then, uh, a part of the predecessor of the PRI, who had happened to support José Vasconcelos' candidacy. Germán was slain, just like Yaramilo, but Lopez Mateos survived. Lopez Mateos slowed himself over the sink and prayed in the silence. I never wanted this, and neither, neither would he have. Maybe nobody else has. Fate corrupts the dearest of us. Reunions. The Palacio de la Comberi was, from the outside, a beautiful structure. A hybrid of neoclassical and Spanish architecture, its walls span multiple blocks in Mexico City. It's also a prison, today. Um, home to the enemies of the PRI, many of whom never leave its walls. Today, as its doors swing open, a husk of a man can be seen walking out, limping along towards a woman, Maria Cavillo. His expression blank. As he reaches an embrace, tears can be seen streaming down her. What have those monsters done to you, mi amor? The woman asks. Since... She she has met with those dry, raspy voices of Salvador Nava, bruises and lacerations all over his body. The darn country is no place for men like me in politics. I'm done. There's lies. The corrupt. The stop kisses him from fishing, finishing. Let's just go home. Uh, San Luis Potosi would be occupied by the military for three more months. Two miles away in the National Palace, Diaz Ordaz meets with the President Lopez, uh, Mateos, in his office, and a coffee shared between the two as a morning sunlight peers through the window. Impressive the way you handled that, Ordaz. Well, it's a shame Madrazo felt in the stocks. In the talks, you and the DFS seem to have made the quick work of Nava after all. And about that guy, Salinas, huh? Both men shook their heads. The, the president continued. The amount of corrupt schemes that man has gotten himself into. I think it's about time we reel him in, don't you think? Ordaz takes a sip of his coffee and reflects on his exploits with the DFS. Useful sons of guns, those agents are. Agreed. He did seem a little uncooperative throughout this whole mess, he responds, and gazes out the window. It's a beautiful outside, isn't it? The Nava crisis has been solved. San Luis Potosi removes the Nava movement. Thank God. President's opinion of Ordaz increased by three. More stability. Loyalty goes up. Oh boy. Thank God. An iron hand on the tiller. Gentlemen, the so-called Kabuki crisis has passed. A round of precise applause succeeded Governor and Division General Antonio Nava Castillo's statement. Surrounding a table of refreshments and unopened folders gathered a group of men in the mixed military and civilian dress. In such a short time, we've already shown the people of Puebla the merits of our administration. With some common sense cost cutting and revamping policies of our disruptive activities, the county will be back on track in no time. But, gentlemen, the mission is not complete. There's still much more to accomplish. Castillo tugged in his military t jacket before watching, uh, walking swiftly to a screen. He pointed to an anxiously waiting lieutenant. On cue, the young soldier activated a projector which projected an image onto the screen next to Castillo. Time to change it. The Academy of Mexico is completely different from beasts than it was ten years ago. The Kabuki Karasa showed us that. Puebla must be modernized if we wish it to be an integral part of the economy. Castillo gave a slight nod. The projected image clicked on a diagram. My staff and I have always been working hard to draft an all-inclusive plan that touches every aspect of the economy. With a firm enough hand, we can force Puebla into the modern era. Just another round of applause where Castillo had planned. You're all here because you have a part to play in this plan. So we can work directly under me. Others are friends and associates. There's a lot to be done and many contracts to be fulfilled. I will need these jobs done by the only men I can trust the most. And of course, you will be paid for your hard labor. Castillo smiled and waited for another applause. The men left, ensuring to a promising future. Here's the Kazakh government reflections. Um, President Lopez Mateo sat in his office, only him, leaning back in his chair as he reflected upon the government's response to the, to the Kabuki effect. The economy exposed the raw within the PRI. What was supposed to be an organ of efficient political action on behalf of the Mexican people was really a factional nightmare. Competing interests within the party did not work together towards what goals they did share, but rather entrenched themselves in the endless gridlock over the areas they disagreed on. He thought himself lucky that he was able to cobble together in response to the Kabuki effect. The part is more inflexible as ever, however, the urgent nature of the crisis gave him the wiggle room he needed to get what he could do get done. He only now hoped that what he could get done would be the right solution to the crisis. The president's thoughts were interrupted when his eyes fell to a newspaper sitting on his desk. Unemployment continues to rise as masses struggle to get by. This would not do. There was so much more work to be done, but the president also knew his own physical limitations were catching up with him. The town would soon come where he could no longer be deemed fit to lead Mexico. Um, the hard times were not over, and luckily would not end before he could resign. Uh, it was time to decide on a successor, one that Lopez Mateos could trust to continue the work. Mexico needs our next president. As Lopez Mateos' presidency reaches its final year, he'll cement his legacy. As the sun sets, President Lopez Mateos is driven by many things. His love for his countrymen, the ideas of the revolution, and a desire to preserve independence, though when boiled down to its most basic form, Mateos shares his intrinsic motivation that drives many like him. He seeks to be remembered. To chisel his legacy into the endless cliff face of human existence, a legacy that can stand the test of time for generations to come to Me in Mexico. The achievements of the energy, nationalization, art, and the massive expansion of the automo automotive industry are monumental. The Mateos must not let up in his old age, lest his desire to cement himself as one of the greats fall short. 
Poverty, land distribution, Mexico's place in the world stage, all issues that must be tackled to fulfill Mateus's dream to become great. So we start working on this stuff? Let's take a look-see here. So you guys are close to losing loyalty. You guys are pretty good. The DFS is extremely loyal. Well, it's almost. Loyalty and power are the same. We need a little more loyalty from these guys. Intelligence is not bad. Industrials are decent. And the power of bureaucracy, they're not loyal at all. Ooh, that's not good. Lower their power or lower their loyalty. Interesting. Reveal the smiling face. Perception. The final ride. That's probably good to do to lower corruption. Hey, that's what we get to do next, though. Mold the institution. Our party, our Leviathan, is a gargantuan beast, spanning the vast ideological, regional, and personal divides that cut across these united Mexican states. Factionalism and rivalries run rampant, and the narrow self interests of thousands of greedy stomachs drive the morass forward. Lopez Mateo sits atop this behemoth, but the reins have long gone limp. But this time the saddle comes to an end, our president will dig in the spurs. With the weight of the party's executive, National Executive Committee, or CEM, and his personal reprimands, he will make clear that the infighting that characterizes the succession process is no longer acceptable. The PRI must unite corporations, militants, and governors. Alma, Almanistas and Cardinistas all be on the tapado. There will be no splits, there will be no dissension. The full power of this mighty sea will be placed into the tapado's waiting hands. Up in flames. The aide knocking at Salinas' door received no response. In his hands, a report on the economic downturn caused by Nava's protesters is laying way for its secretary to read. Knock. The aide knew that the secretary Salinas was inside and put his ear to the door to see how his boss was doing. Heavy breathing was heard, followed by a mildly panicked voice. Can you please repeat that again, Antonio? Salinas said, his professional demeanor slipping away. Did I hear something about warming up to our dogs before it's too late? You're a weather vane, huh? You spineless coward. The sound of a phone slamming that was heard, starting the aide, who immediately walked away. Now was not the time. The office spun around Salinas' head, his walls crumbling to make way for his fears. Penetrating passes collected in calm guise and stabbing his ego, twisting the knife. The Nava affair blown up in his face, taking his chances of getting into Los Pinos along with it. His perfect plan had gone awry. A light pout left his mouth, but the moment of weakness quickly passed. It would not end like this. Calm down, Secretary, he reassured himself. His mind contemplating how best to secure his legacy in the country he had served for so long. All at once, Salinas realized how little had actually changed. He had no shot of being Lopez Mateos' successor before the Lucian Crisis. His enemies were bound to slip up again, he just needed to be ready to exploit the next mistake. His mind raced, new ideas began already forming in his head. The long game had just begun. There's always another plan. The Kabuki Crisis will continue to evolve. El Tapado is chosen. The president will form them soon. Uh, some comments conclude, uh, some people really want me to get um, Madra Madrazo. For this campaign, we're the best chance is to go with Ordaz for now. Maybe the next campaign, maybe the next campaign we'll do Salinas. I don't know, we'll see. I'm open to either one. Um, either candidate seems fine to me. I don't, it doesn't really concern me. Who? I just play for fun. Usually. Sometimes role play. Actually, most of the time we're just role playing here. Oh. Well, let's do water to water everywhere. And then we'll do the, the projects. Where there was once road. There's now a murky brown edifying torrent, or eddying torrent of water, lurching forward like a dying beast. Within its depths and along its surface, the pieces of towns and villages float by in bizarre peace. Logs, painting, bodies, even homes ripped from their foundations. Oh no. Great clouds rolled in the sky with a trickling rain reminding those under them that the flood was just the beginning. A few people looked out of the windows, barely perched over the water, desperately fruitlessly holding back the tide, and a few lay on the mountainside, with nothing to their name but so close and the assurance of loss. Alongside the great stream were husks of buildings, many of their occupants long ago, having fled, whether into the jungles or mountains, or simply higher areas within the decimated village. The church atop the hill hung over the town as the only building unaltered. The villagers thank God and the Virgin for that. Beyond that village, across mountains and forests, uh, the great stream continued, expanded and thinned, and grew again. Many boats traveled along it, some intended vessels, others simply pieces of wood stitched together by the desperate. They occasionally floated by other destroyed towns and were joined by new refugees. Some headed east towards the foothills, where their drivers declared that they had connections to Mexico City. Others to the swamp via Hermosa, or other cities to, being, to beg amidst the ruins, beseeching long-departed politicians for succor. The southeast is sinking, and Mexico City must raise it, lest other things besides water begin to saturate the heads of the region's people, yet not a drop to relieve their suffering. Oh boy. So, what do we got here? Baja California. Moderately active economy. Uh huh. Corruption. Stimulation impact. No political power. Pretty normal. How the beneficial rewards this rewards of this project will be determined through an event chain. Baja plan. I kind of want to see what that is. Real GDP growth is at least 6%. Oh. 1500 days. 1500 days. Baja plan. I want to see what the Baja plan is. 
That seems kind of unique and special. Is there anything else here? New electricity plant? No. So let's do the Baja plan. In the wilderness. And the Rike stepped back into the streets of Ensenada, greeted only by a forlorn horn and a block over. Back when his mind was louder, stating again and again that the final phrase from the law office, but we have a certain reputation, Senor Ruiz. One of your past or organizing could harm. He had heard the phrase before, from different mouths and with different words, but since he had graduated. He heard it in his own voice as he lay down to sleep. Enrique kept putting one foot in front of the other. A gaggle of drunken American tourists stood laughing below a bar sign in English, younger than him, with dollars in their pockets, beer on their breath, and not a care in their head. They ignored the suited Mexican brushing path. Returned of Brosteros, with calloused hands and worn bodies, aged fishermen, tattered clothes, streaking with grime, polished black shoes racing down creek pavement. Uh, they and Enrique came to a halt in front of a familiar bus. Stop. No pan organizer taking this former post here, just tired faces. Dispatch from Ensenada to ride over potholed roads. Take orders from a gringo half their age. To return home covered in machine grease and sweat to have no future. Would he be on that bus tomorrow? So, let's see. Ooh. Airport, huh? Interesting. El Granero Dam. Another proposal in the dock is to construct a medium-sized dam in the city of Chihuahua. Aside from that, there's nothing else notable about the project. Okay. More base stimulation, which is nice. The production unit. Uh, Puerto Elias Cayas Dam. Base stimulation. Farming. Ooh. Well, how much are we investing in farming? Because that could be really good. Farming productivity goes up to 91%. I think this is the one that we've been doing for really trying to get our farms up. I like that one. The dam is pretty good. Zarpa Dam. Not bad, not bad. Base simulation. I think I want to do this one, actually. Located on the Nazas River in the Durango State, the construction of the dam will allow us to control the flow of the river, assist us in preventing flooding, and provide us with various economic privileges. Simulation effect 2%. Alright, who it's the next place? Central North. Moderately active. Leon Stadium. Museum of Insurgency. We did, and we did do the new international airport, which is nice. New electricity plant. Unemployed population gets better. Better quality of life. Less urban po rural population. Um, I like the base stimulation. 1% is not much. 530 days. It's cost a little more. More war support political power. Uh, quality of life. You know what? Maybe do this one. For the most humble peasant women, mending garments at dust, to the mightiest captain of industry, planning a new factory. Mexicans need electricity. We'll meet that need by constructing the next generation power facilities, each one a monument to the advancement of our nation. And just straight up west. So we did what? The new international airport. New electricity plant, Plaza Monumental. Guadalajara Condominium. And this is in the year 1964. It is projected that Guadalajara will surpass 1 million residents. A number that is projected to double decade on decade in the future as it absorbs its surrounding communities. Such immigration necessitates housing, and these public works will provide that alongside. All the needed services making for quality, affordable housing in the city. Mm, I like that one, which we already did. We can't do this one, of course. Our population goes down. Get better unemployed. We really work on that, but this is kind of unique. I want to do something that's unique. All right, the oldest ally, Mateos, have been a politician for decades now. He was the president of the United Mexican States for crying out loud, but even to him, things seem so hard these days. His headaches seemed to have no end no matter how many pills he took, and they were finally affecting his work. He spent all morning reading the regulations being proposed post-Kabuki, but with every word he understood, another three became mindless scribbles. For the first time in years, he felt completely overwhelmed to deal with this by himself. He needed help, so he turned to the man he trusted the most. But a few knocks on the Ordaz's office door were all he needed to get a stoa come in from his old friend. Ordaz put down a set of papers and rose from his chair to greet the president. Your Excellency, with what may I help you? Please, Gustavito, please sit and forget about titles. I just need some help going through these regulations. Uh, Mateo says he threw a handful of documents on top of Ordaz's desk. I see. You too have fallen prey to this mess. One certainly does not expect that becoming a politician involves reading things cobbled together by monkeys on typewriters. Um, Ordaz said as he sat back down and revealed his copy of the documents. But I guess it's our party of monkeys on typewriters. That seems a bit too harsh, Mateo said as he sat down across Ordaz, picking up his documents. After a glance, he turned back to Ordaz, though some of them definitely need pointers. Well, let's get started. After hours of reviewing the legislation, but mostly just looked joking and laughing for its many, many flaws, the pair was nearly done for the day. For Mateos, working with Ordaz almost didn't seem like work, even if many people, people called them polar opposites, sure. They do have their differences, and Mateos couldn't count the number of times they had butted heads, but that was due to Ordaz being his oldest ally, both men, when they were senators, and now they were here, holding the two most important positions in the country, and laughing. 
Clarity seemed to reach Mateos as his laughter died down. His gaze met Ordaz's and he said, My friend, I want you to be the next president. Ooh, into the waves. The president's office was dead silent as Madrazo kept on reading the report about the floods battering the south. Line by line, he read ca casualty estimates, reports of entire villas swept away, and stories of heroism happening in spite of the public services in his home city of Tabasco. Putting it down for a moment, he struggled to vocalize his feelings in the matter. I remember hearing about the public works officials, the meteorologists, saying this was a matter of time. He looked as if finding someone to pin the blame on other than himself. If only the proper infrastructure was in place, the rural areas would not be so vulnerable to something like this. Madrazo, Lopez Mateos, interrupted the duress, gu distressed governor. Enough of the past. It is irrelevant now. The president spoke with a paternalistic inflection. This is your state, Madrazo. You know what you must do. You cannot do anything by reading reports and shifting blame hundreds of miles away. Of course, Your Excellency. The governor straightened himself out. I was just about to leave for my flight in a few hours anyway. Madrazo tosses the report to the side and stands up. No use in reading that any longer. It is time I see for myself. With that. It begins to leave the room, though I stop by Lopez Mateos once more. Wait, Madrazo, the governor turns around. Let me come with you. Good luck. Ooh. I'm not sure what this does, but... On reflection. In the closing hours of His Excellency the President's office, one of Adolfo Lopez Mateos' fleet of assistants and aides had placed a box with two lines of ribbons tied around it during a meeting with some fleeting state official. When the man had left and Mateos had finished reviewing the paperwork said man had given him, he unwrapped the box. It was from Ava. The card inside simply said, Dear Husband. The object accompanying it was a framed photograph of Mateos from his time as Secretary of Labor and Social Welfare. Mateos gave the photograph a good view. His face was less wrinkly, his hair lying a good deal closer to his eyebrows than it was the back of his head. When he looked into the eyes of a man almost a decade younger than him, he saw ambition, ambition that carried him to the very chain that he sat in right now. He placed a photograph on his desk. If he looked back as if he was lost. He had known that the moment he raised his arm to swear the oath of office to of the United Mexican States on December 1st, 1958. Here the future evaded him. One more year of the presidency. It was proud of his work, and his countrymen were proud of him too, of the diligence Mateo had shown to them during his tenure. And if you viewed it in a slightly skewed way, Mateo had saved the world. Yet he still felt unsure, he felt it all slipping away. Why? An invisible, evil presence held his head hidden in his thoughts, a presence he wished he could confront and defeat. Mateo feared it, fearing that if he turned to see what he dreaded most, the only thing he would see would be his own eyes, his own face, that would not do. He called an aide to bring coffee and for a political advisor, whichever was closest. There was work to be done, old wounds would be soon shut. Mexico waited the breath of fresh air that was promised every six years on December 1st, yet they barely knew the name of the man that would replace his own, and what the name represented it, and how much it would change their lives. Mateos, the president, did not have much time left. He would be darned if in a year from now Mateos, the man, regretted that time being wasted. The final battle begins. With the identity of Tapado revealed, the battle for the nation decision category has been locked. Maybe we shouldn't have gone with him then. I want to see what happens, though. The sins of a few washed away. As a dry breeze swept through the ruined town and over Madrazo's uh, face, he could almost hear the cries of those who once called the Villa home, swept away into the annals of history. Behind him lie dozens of excavators, dump trucks, and cement mixtures. An army wielding concrete and wood uh, was set on rebuilding the rural Tabasco town stronger than it ever had before. His moment of silence was interrupted by a group of his constituents, the remaining residents, and their relatives. Governor Madrazo, a moment of your time if you don't mind. The old man that set forward bore the look of loss, Madrazo thought to himself, a kid, maybe. Governor Madrazo, a moment of your time. Of course, sir. We know you'd come through for us eventually in the form of food and water, maybe, but this is simply astounding. New houses, palming, he gestured around the town, the whirling of machinery masking his words. You and President Lopez Mateos have nothing but our gratitude. Madrazo had graciously accepted the man's sentiment, and the same situation repeated itself all across the day's tours through Tabasco townships. Return to Via Hermosa. He picked up the newspaper on the way to his nightly study. Relaxing in his chair, he read the headline Tabasco to return stronger than ever, thanks to Madrazo. Look at that. Fantastic. Uh, so what do we got here? Good quality of life. No population stuff. Um, agriculture. Yeah, we could do this one. Um, better stimulation, which is nice. Slightly unproductive. Slightly unproductive. Yeah, we can make it more productive. Technically, it won't help very much. And honestly, with all the rest of the projects here, we can make them even more productive. Um. We can lower our baseline, or no, raise our baseline of productivity, because I was really killing this place earlier, so. We get a little more, stim a little more stimulation, maybe. It doesn't give us that much to work with. It's not very much, but it does a little bit here. And that does help out with poverty a little bit. So we're molding the institution for the International Olympic Committee. So close, Adolfo. One more day. The president takes a mean gander at his exhausted figure in the mirror of the hotel bathroom. His normally youthful eyes finally begin to crack under the weight of the many trips undertaken in the past months. His head pounding from all the stress. Hey, it's like me. 
Except I'm not leader of, the, of Mexico. That'd be really cool, though. It all had led up to this. The endless deal brokering, diplomatic speaking, and countless hours of jet lag would all have been for nothing if his country did not uh, receive the Olympic nomination this night. As he walked down the halls of the Swiss hotel with his team donning the finest of Mexican attire he could, could offer, he eyed the bar on the way out in the lobby. If things will go the way we want tonight, he pointed to the bottles of booze, turning to his aid, I know where I'll be going. The two shared a nervous chuckle. The old Lopez Mateos. Hadn't had a day this long in years, he thought to himself ang anxiously, waiting eating hours in the International Olympic Committee building as the members cast their votes on the secret ballots. The president's headache was lessened by the surge of excitement and adrenaline that slowly crawled up upon him as each vote was cast. He knew his presidency would be remembered as a home for better or for worse, though, though this, with this vote, such memory would encompass the world stage. The windows of the grandiose building became bedazzled with patterns of orange and pink as the sunset drew nearer, and the day became a blur for Lopez Mateos, anxiously waiting for the result. When the time came for the selection speech, he didn't register a single word aside from the last two. Mexico City. The imperfect dictatorship applies a new facade. The final ride. Um, I like lowering corruption. I think that would be good to do, too. Perception is nice, too. As high noon fades into the twilight of Lopez Mateos' uh, sexenio, the shadows grow long. The president had held himself to the leftmost within the Constitution, uh, an opportunity to reinvigorate an ebbing revolution. But perhaps the structures of the party were too tight and perhaps the man too flawed for such a monumental a task. Necess necessary or not, Mexico's great hope leaves a trail of corpses behind him. But that will not last. That will not, cannot be a sole legacy. In this last year, Lopez Mateos will can couple social reform with efforts to soften the PRI's heavy hand. Pri political prisoners, who no longer pose a threat, will walk free. Enemies will be co-opted rather than crushed. Perhaps that will be enough to exchange a black hat for a white one on this last ride. Uh, marble and gold. What else do we want to do here? Unemployed population. I'm not sure what, where to see it, what we our goals are. It's like for the economy and whatnot, so... Unemployed population goes down, that's really good. Stimulation. Base stimulation goes up, which is actually really nice. So we definitely want to loosen labor loss just a little bit. Just a little bit. It actually lowers your urban quality of life. Huh. Now where's the workers? Uh, workers. We don't do it too much. We can use them a little more too. The presidential limousine came to a smooth halt before the Palacio de Bel Belas Artes. As the man of the hour emerged, he was greeted with a, a cavalcade of flashbulbs and questions. Every journalist deemed to capture the winning smile, the winning phrase that won the 1968 Olympic Games for Mexico City. Lopez Mateos waved but said nothing, simply taking in the soaring applause from the top echelons of the PRI and the, of Mexican high society. A jaunty stride carried him along the Palacio's walkway through its marble columns and past its entrance, a sea of evening dresses and tuxedos parting before him with each step forward. As he disappeared in the palace, a sign took hold of the crowd. Was he not there to celebrate this triumph? To revel and become the first developing nation to host the Olympics? Mateos dispelled any doubts. As he emerged into the palace's balcony, arms aloft in victory, a few sharp eyes saw another figure follow at his right hand, face yet obscured. The president approached the railing and with a voice owned by El Grito addressed his audience. Tonight I stand below the beautiful statue of harmony, as I stand in a beautiful, harmonious nation. One whose collective efforts has turned the eyes of the world upon it, to witness the glories it is producing. This success is a success of the whole Mexican people. For their only view I can thank tonight, for his greatest service to our nation, and for making these Olympics a reality, I would like to like Secretary Gustavo Diaz Ordaz Bolaños, Bolaños to say a few words. Lopez Mateo stood aside as El Tapado stepped forward to cheer, to the, cheer the crowd. The Olympic laurel crowns Ordaz presidential candidate of the PRI. Before we choose anything here, do we have any other options? Yes, we do. Worker quality of life won't slightly increase if we want to do that one. Real quality of life, stimulation, urban quality of life. Quality of life. So, we definitely want to loosen labor laws. Um, we can stimulate them a little more if we wanted to. Two point, and it's just so good to do the golf, it's just so much. They're the base stimulation right now. They're at base. I think I assume all of this would really be at base, yeah. Sixty-one. Yeah, so it doesn't really matter which one we choose for the most part. Fifty-two point one nine. The floor. That's pretty bad. Um, so let's go and do uh, this one. Where is it? Number base simulation. It helps unemployment too. And actually for this place, before we do this one, in the Yucatan, there's a lot of rural areas. And by doing this, it helps balance it out slightly more. So we're gonna go back here and we're gonna do 
Oh, it does. Selected as a PRI candidate. So, I apologize we didn't go the route that you wanted, but it is what it is. Today's Excellency, President Adolfo Lopez Mateos, and President of the National Executive Committee of the Institutional Revolutionary Party General Alfonso Corona del Rosal announced that Licenciado Gustavo Diaz Ordaz Bolaños will be the party's candidate in the upcoming 1964 elections. The current Secretary of the Interior is a respected statesman known for his effective handling of illegal railway strikes. More recently, Ordaz applied the full extent of the law to deal with Salvador Nava and his radical followers. He spent years defending the security and welfare of the Mexican people. Many government and party officials, such as Governor Carlos Madrazo and Licenciado Octaviano Campos Salas, has announced their support for Ordaz's campaign. Mexico's future is secure, revealing the smiling face. Lopez Mateos' mighty finger, El Dedazo, points with clarity and finality to his successor, a revelation of utmost importance to Mexico's political classes. But El Tapado does not yet command the attention of the public, which remains focused on the fallout from the twin Kabuki and Nava crises. This will be changed. Through joint events, directed press coverage, and leaks of flattering biographical details the Mexican people will come to know and love El Tapado, the decision will be packaged in appealing morsels, and its qualifications drilled into every mind. When July 5th arrives, every citizen will know the foremost name on the ballot, and when December 1st arrives, they will recognize the new president's authority. Holding court, Hector stopped the ruffles grandson Chuco's hair as he strode through the foyer of his house, the hustle and bustle of laughter and chatter spilling from adjacent rooms. Look how tall you've gone, huh? You're the picture of your mother. He scooped up the towel in his arms and peeked through. Uh, one of the ajar uh, doors, only to be assaulted by a stampede of more grandchildren who clung to him like desperate hanger-ons. Chuko uh, sprung free of Hector's ug, nearly tripping over Elena as he ran to join his cousins and siblings. She gave her grandson a stern, earful. Hector huffed. Go easy on me, on the boy, mi amor. I need to tell you something anyway. He skipped a beat to shut the door in the hallway. Ordaz is going to be the next president. We'll have to get some of the officials around for dinner next week, you know. Ramon, Benito, the rest of the CNC. Discuss strategy. Elena turned after having perused her reflection in some decorative porcelain. Now, what do you think of Senor Ordaz? Hector turned, gathering his thoughts. He's very skilled. Uh, it came from nothing but put those layabout railway men back to work. Do you not remember the shortages? If it weren't for Ordaz. And you see something of yourself in this bootstrapping? Elena shot a playful smile. Hector shrugged. And then frowned, but not Elena's comment. On the other hand, he's also made a mess of things with Americans and might have put that guy, Lopez Avalar, in the governor, too. A pause, realizing he was rambling. I look forward to seeing him in the job. Ordaz is a good man, certainly. Certainly. Nobody's perfect. He's hideous, Hector. Have you not been uh, seen what he looks like? Elena curled her nose like he just smelled something noxious. How will you inspire anyone with that bonobo face of his? Hey, man. You can't help it. Oh, science expenditures? Screw it. Max it out. Just rewards. Gustavo, you want to see me? Ask Madrazo. Ordaz just for him to sit down. There was a time when Ordaz thought that the man as little more than a nuisance, a naive, ideal, a naive idealist, who used dangerous populist rhetoric to advance his career now. After they faced down several crises together, Ordaz saw something more in him. As you know, Lopez Mateos has chosen me as his successor. I will be selected my cabinet soon. Mexico needs men with integrity and passion in the government. Men like you. How would you like to be president of the National Executive Committee? Madrazo froze, completely stunned. Are you serious? Of course I'm serious. You've been a valuable ally, and I believe you'll do well as a leader of the PRI. Appointing you will ruffle some feathers in the party, but if you moderate some of your positions, I'm sure it'll be... Thank you so much, Gustavo. But Durazo interrupted, smiling widely. I promise I won't let you down. This is an amazing opportunity, and I'm not going to waste it. Together, it'll be an, unst an, an unstoppable team. As the excitement was infectious, some things must change so they can remain the same. Thorn in her side, driving with specters. So which route do we want to go next? Poverty will get better. I like that. Check in on the 11-year plan. Academic base gets better. I like that, too. Infrastructure and redistribution versus mechanization and professionalization. I like this more because you get more farming from every, every place. A light in the dark. More loyalty is nice. Throw it in our side. I don't want to lower bureaucrat loyalty, though. You get more bureaucrat loyalty. A united revolution. A sell El Tabado to the public will improve. Power to get better versus the federal republic. The embers of the Porfiriato. It's not bad. Where skies and seas enjoying. Who can use more loyalty? There's pictures of a Mexico of the future. Amidst all the bright shining cities, modern infrastructure, and strong industry that you're sure to see, picture all the people. See the bright shining faces. Confident and content. A beacon of happiness that matches the next person in the next. And they're sure that way that they can squeeze their hands of their loved ones as they continue on with their day. This is the PRI's vision of the future. And if indeed the day will come that Mexico will stand strong with its vaults removed, we must assure people that we have reached that height. It's exactly through all the positive development that we hope to promote these images. The beckoning. Uh, and prosperity of peace among nations, opening up a sea of opportunities for all Mexicans. Heading on this path, that perhaps will no longer be just a picture. The German Civil War. I'll give me a second here. 
And into the Reich. Surely. In good hands. <coughs> Traditionally, presidential candidates are expected to give up any governmental positions they currently hold before running. Uh, now that Lopez Mateos had officially chosen him as successor, Ordaz had to resign the post as Secretary of the Interior. As he packed up his office and prepared to leave, he reflected on his tenure. He served Lopez Mateos faithfully, guiding the country through its many crises. It was here that his mistakes had nearly cost him the presidency. Uh, and through his work, he had won it back. Now he could just easy knowing the job would be in good hands. Uh, Luis Echeverria. Alvarez quickly entered uh, a serious expression on his face. The young man who had been Ordaz's undersecretary was all business. Echeverria was dependable, always keeping a level head and doing whatever was required of him. It's an honor to succeed you in this office, Echeverria said politely. The honor's all mine, Luis. You served me well, and I know you'll continue to do so. Make yourself comfortable. I have a feeling the next president will keep you in this role. After Ordaz left the room, Echeverria took a seat at the desk. Instead of taking a moment to relish his promotion, he pulled out a stack of reports and began to work. Talented men are few, loyal men fewer. No, more political power, great. More stability, too. There's no one more worthy of our trust. Oh, we actually lost stability because of that. Crap. Hold the line. The Sonoran Sierra is a land of many tales. Some tales are of history. Spoken by the Yaqui, so the valor and suffering of their ancestors are never forgotten. They tell of a line drawn in the sand of the first meeting. The Spanish cross and blood was shed. Uh, they talk, tell of a brief peace. As the Jesuit introduced them to the Lord, their God, but their miners came, they crossed the line, and God spared neither Yaqui or Qui, or an intruder from the war that followed. After Mexico's independence, Fresh assaults were prepared upon the line. They tell the worst trespass of Porfirio, Porfirio Diaz, who for his mines and farms would rage war against them. Upon the Yaqui's great hero, Kajime, they fought back, but betrayed but killed Kajime, and the people were decimated. A quarter dead, half who remained sold as slaves to the Yucatan. Far from home, their forebears were murdered by the lash, hunger, and despair. <coughs> the revolution came to Sonora, and the Yaqui could for a moment withdraw the line. They tell of Cardenas, who as a general would, sub would subjugate the Yaqui amidst the chaos. They tell of how Obregón pervaded the promise of the revolution with his discriminatory laws, and how Rodolfo Calles, governor of Sonora, would end that promise forever. He expelled the Yaqui from the rightful land, murdering those who opposed him. Cardenas would create a government department for the indigenous peoples, but he did not restrain Calles, and the department did not bring back the dead. The revolution did not restore the line. So, when the new tales arrived, tales of guerrilla fighters taking up arms in the neighboring Chihuahua, the Yaqui listened, soon with their own tale would be told. This is not good. We need more growth. Inflation is getting high. Deficit's not looking good either. Uh oh. Hello? Yeah, keep it high here. Two dead men. Uh, Lazaro Cardenas rolled down the window, letting the cascade of songs, cheers, and jubilant honks reverberate around the cab. The federal district had been this joyous, this alive since his nationalization of the oil industry so many years before. It was alive because Adolfo Hitler was dead, with his crumbling colossus soon to follow. As several disfigured effigies parted to pass Cardenas, paid his fare and tipped the driver, his farewell unheard since behind a celebratory crackle of antique gunfire and patardos. As he pushed his aching joints along the raucous and gridlock streets, the general thought back to the night he could have had, entertaining Emil and colleagues and retiring early to bed, but no, an impulse drove him forward. In the silence and stillness of the Pantheon Frances greeted the former president who went, wended his way to a familiar headstone. He kneeled and he was popping beside the remains of Manuel Avila Camancho. After a moment he spoke, it's been almost ten years now, old friend. Most days I think the wrong one of us is standing. This country is more yours than mine, Manuel. A stable one, one at peace with the Yankees, the church in itself. They certainly make use of that social disillusion of yours, even if they forget the peasant that, that they say they're protecting. But can I put you on that? You who fought by my side in Yalisco and Michoacan. You knew what the revolution was, what it meant. No, that's not why I'm here today. I'm here because you, a general of the revolution, and a president of our nation, did nothing. Nothing as beasts roamed the earth, or nation spared only by the Atlantic, nothing as our sailors, struck by German torpedoes, drowned in oil, nothing. As the world lost its only chance to put down that madman, and nor for that I will never forgive you, and Cardenas spat on Camacho's grave. A man of the future, though. President, Lopez Mateos knew his days were numbered, and the old statesman began to ponder his legacy, the land distribution, expansion of health care, housing and education, his overtures to the Caribbean, the careful balancing of superpower interests, or sometimes harsh measures towards dissent. Uh, whatever it may be, Lopez Mateos did it all for Mexico's future, for her children and families, a people which, like the rest of the world, lies under the nuclear sword of Damocles. While Lopez Mateos can help to control the apocalyptic stockpiles of the superpowers, he will do his part to make sure Mexico does not partake in the charade. That's why today he signed the declaration for the prohibition of nuclear weaponry in Mexico. The frail president cannot give bombastic speeches like he used to, his energy dwindling. Though today he stands in front of the Congress and the Mexican people, proud to show one of his final acts, calling upon the rest of Latin America to follow Mexico's footsteps, this declaration must not only act in our interest in upholding our values and human rights, it must also serve as an example to all of our Latin American brothers. I challenge him to follow suit in the quest for human posterity, by means of commitment to nuclear non-proliferation and prohibition of such destructive weapons. 
Well, that's Mateos. Thin with hair, white as snow. Kind of like me. Staggered off stage, but his message drank clearer than ever. Mexico would commit to the prohibition of nuclear weapons. The first nation to do so in Latin America. An example set for others to follow. Whilst fate drew ever closer, Lopez Mateos would make sure the same could have be said for Mexico. An important day for only some Bach one, but I think we wanted there. We've done very well. We've survived the crisis so far. We've chosen a successor, and we're we're doing well. Don't talk about the economy, or the yearly deficit, whatever. But if you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow as we continue on with Mexico. Thanks for watching, and have a great rest of your day.